My name is Mindy Johnson and welcome to Primary Sources. Uh, we are, are really excited about our guest today. Um, this really lends us to um, some exciting areas of discussion. And so to get us underway, I wanted to uh, bring to you, get us sort of into the mode of what we're going to be exploring. Um, oftentimes when we as creatives reach a level of success um, or we accomplish a goal that we've set out to do, um, it, it marks a turning point. Uh, it's a, generally a completion of one thing and we're moving to the next. And there's a bit of a, a challenge there to traverse uh, from that level of success onto what is next. Um, and when you stand on the precipice and you look ahead to, to what that next project could be, it's a very different terrain, um, particularly in the creative realm. Um, a lot of unknowns. We're familiar with what we know, but we're headed out in a new course, a new direction. And it requires something that uh, I think too often is overlooked, vision, sensing with the eyes, but yet in many ways having sort of an inner sense uh, uh, to envision or picture mentally. And having that vision and being able to sustain that vision through traversing many of the challenges in our world, particularly uh, as creatives, can be uh, an adventure <laughs> to say the least. These are adventures that are not going to happen overnight. They are long-term. And oftentimes in ensuring these uh, visions uh, will see completion, we have to navigate a lot of uh, challenges and, and uh, unusual and unforeseen areas, which can oftentimes send us off maybe adrift or in a course or direction on our own we may have thought we didn't think we'd ever get to. Um, and this is where team comes in persons forming at the sides of a game or a contest, associated in the same similar action, uh, joining together, gathering uh, in a cooperative effort. And if you can get someone who uh, comes along with you on that vision, uh, the load gets easier, the course gets a little more traversable, and soon the numbers grow. Uh, and it is that team effort that gets us to reach the heights uh, and the accomplishments that, that we're looking, the vision uh, leads us to. And finally reaching that mountaintop again. Um, oh, that it would be an easier course, but more often than not, it's not. And our guest today knows a lot about this. Um, we are so excited to have Sergio Pavlos with us, a director, screenwriter, and animator within the animation industry. Uh, beginning his career as an animator at Walt Disney Animation Studios, working on these great classic films as a goofy movie, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hercules, Treasure Planet, Tarzan, uh, Annie Award uh, nomination for his character designs and supervising animation on some of the great characters from these films. Following his time at Disney, he went on to found Spa Studios. There he and his team of artists have worked with industry leading clients, uh, winning animation director for Asterix uh, and the Vikings and animation supervisor for uh, Nocturna. His work as a character designer in Rio earned him Annie Award nominations for best character design in a feature production, an executive producer and writer of Despicable Me and Smallfoot. A lot of exciting things emanated from Spa Studios, including uh, most recently uh, his multi-award winning uh, Klaus. As writer, producer, and director, nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture on this film, and winning multiple awards, uh, Best Animated Feature for the Annies, Best Director in a Feature Production, Best Storyboarding in a Feature Production, winning BAFTAs, uh, and more recent awards as well, uh, all across the board. An exciting, extraordinary accomplishment. So it is my great pleasure to welcome today Sergio Pablos, uh, a gentleman, a visionary, a creative, who understands these challenges in seeing a vision 
all the way through to its completion. So thank you for being here, Sergio. Thank you for having me. Uh, great pleasure. Welcome. Although coming to us from Spain, yes? That's right. <laughs> and hopefully uh, uh, in, the, in the evening. So we, we welcome our, our wide time frame differences here. And thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we see a lot of great uh, activity on the chat board. So we're going to get underway with some questions, but we will jump in and um, get to your chat questions along the way. So Sergio, uh, let's start uh, as a creative and uh, primarily as a writer. Let's start with the writing process. Um, you have shaped some of the most impactful films of late uh, within our collective consciousness. And uh, that all begins with an idea, a, a germ of an idea. Uh, how, do you, how do you find, where are you getting inspiration for your ideas? And then what process do you take in sort of formulating, brewing them, seeing how they're taking shape? Uh, they come from different places. Uh, usually um, there's always like a kernel of inspiration, which could be just an image or a feeling or a character. Uh, and then you, you, you go from there and you find out, is there a story here? Right. And sometimes you go, sometimes that never really gels. Like there's always at any given time, maybe 10 or 12, concepts floating around my head that may never gel into anything they're just like it would be interesting to do something with that uh in the case of the speakable me it was it was um i wanted to do the idea of of um if you um like at the end of a, on a bond film after the big climax and the you know the island base has blown up and uh and the uh, you know uh, and the heroes won. What if we go home with a villain instead and see what happens next, right? So there was always that idea of what would happen then. Uh, but until the idea for the three little girls and the message of fatherhood came along, I, it was only that. It was only when those things happened that I said, okay, there's a story there and I can go and actually write something up and develop something. But um, many of these ideas just stay just as loose concepts and never gel. And uh, but every now and then something happens, and then then and then there's a torrent. The moment you have that key, there's a torrent of creativity that goes along with it. Like, oh, let me let me uh, all these things that come together immediately, you know, um, and all the possibilities, you know. And oftentimes you just know that there's a good story in there somewhere, and it's up to you to go dig it out. Uh, but you're very aware that your limitations may very well prevent you from finding that. So it's it's a bit of a gamble sometimes. Yeah. Do you keep a uh, like an idea journal or uh, files or sketches that just have get to a point and then you set them aside and bring them back? No, uh, like no. Usually it stays in my head until that clicks, and when it clicks, then I can start sketching. And sketching helps me visualize, but uh, not before that usually. And when developing, so you, you get your ideas, um, formulating them together, I've noticed that you work quite a bit with sort of the, the contrast, the conflicts, the opposites. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about that, how, how that helps to explore, um, particularly when you're developing an idea. Well, um, I try to find that kernel of truth, uh, not uh, so much, uh, um, uh, um, you know, uh, morale, but a kernel of truth that is uncontestable. Like, like, what's this film about? And once I find it, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll try to put the truest version of that on the screen as I can, right? And it's usually not about preaching to people or lecturing. It's like about here's something I believe in, and I think it's a fairly universal truth. How can we express that in a poetic way through filmmaking, right? And in the, in the case of Klaus, it was a true act of goodwill always sparks another. And that was, to me, the, the, the translation to what the Christmas spirit is. So if we can actually take that and make it into that feeling of a Christmas spirit, then we can uh, tell this story. And then that may be where I would go, okay, I want to make this point the clearest possible. That's where I, I will push, pull on the extremes as much as I can and say, I, I, I'd rather have, if I'm going to have a, a guy who learns to be altruistic, 
at the end of this film, let me make him an egotistical jerk and go as far to the other side as I possibly can, even though I'm risking having the audience not like him too much in the beginning, but hopefully in doing so, they will root for him as he starts to change, you know? So, um, so I like to see how far I can stretch these concepts and see if, uh, at, the, at the risk of sometimes going too far, but, uh, but I prefer to make the point uh, loud and clear, right? Okay. Do you, uh, when you're, when you're then taking these ideas, formulating them, getting your pitches together, um, talk a little bit about that process. I know we are in some interesting times and some interesting challenges with, with pitching ideas. Um, mm -hmm. But is, are some things I know in the case of Despicable Me, uh, your origin began with a of what about a six page treatment and then expanded with a lot of visuals. Do you find the visual support is, is more, uh, particularly today in pitching, is that gonna be your biggest strength? I think it's about who you are as a person. Like if you are, I've, I've seen people going to a room with nothing and just through sheer ability to communicate and charisma, just be able to get people on board. I, I realized early on that I, I had to get better at that skill, but how, how, however good I managed to get, it was never going to be as good as if I used my, my ability to draw to make the point, right? Because uh, what you're doing with your pitching is you're trying to get them to picture, you know, uh, not only uh, the what what your story is about, but the tone and the and the messages and the implications, and those are so subjective that it's really easy to have someone who's listening to you picture his own version of the story if you're not careful. So I find that using these illustrations as a, as a, as a way to lock down their imagination onto something. So they're going along with me because I often say, I used to think that uh, failure when you pitch is one that you got to know. But then I realized failure is when you leave the room and you realize they didn't get it. That's really the actual failure when you, when you, fail at communicating because they can say no that's always the prerogative but and and that's fine you know but but if you really are you know uh, falling short in getting your point across then that's on you right talk a little bit about failure what where, where has uh, what have you learned from failure what have, and how do you turn from failure how do you utilize that to feed into I learned I learned that we, uh, it's, it's it, a, a bit of an obvious realization, but it, you, you cannot live with it. Like we assume that if you're going to learn to ride a bicycle or, or skateboard, you're going to fall. That's part of it. You know, that's uh, we all know we will fall. And, you know, when my kid gets a skateboard, I'm like, okay, get the, get the bandages ready. That's going to, you know, it's not, no one ever learns without falling out of those things. And that's fine. And we understand that. But for some reason in, in the schooling system, we punish failure. We don't, uh, we, we kind of drive into our brains that, you know, getting something wrong is, is to be avoided at all costs. And, and I, and then it's hard to remind you again, Oh, the only way to learn is by learning from your mistakes. And, uh, so, it was a bit of a realization uh, for me when I started, you know, when I started pitching, I assumed I was going to fail. I assumed that I'm not going to get this right on the first try. And I think that's a big part of, uh, if you set yourself up for a long run, you know, like, like uh, this is a new profession. I've never done this before. And it's going to take as long as my old profession to, to get good at. So, so it's fine. Um, being okay with accepting that you will fail uh, and then if you take a risk, uh, you know, like, like in my case, setting up a company and putting, you know, uh, you know, putting all your effort behind something and knowing that it's just a 50, 50 chance at best that you will succeed. And if you picture what will it look like if you do fail and it's, and you go, well, it's not as bad, you know, it's, it's fine, you know, uh, so being okay with failing is okay. Uh, and embracing failure as a tool to learn anything you, you do is also okay. As long as you take something 
out of it. As long as you go, okay, what did I do? How did I get here? How can I adjust it? You know, so a lot of my learning to getting better at pitching and, and, and selecting project was, was about that. Like, what did I do that I could do better next time? And yes, there are geological time periods. Like you spend like a whole year on a project and you fail. And that seems like a lot of wasted time, but like everything you get better and faster at it. So you gotta be okay with it. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit also about this idea of your studio. You've been working at Disney for a number of years. Um, this vision of, of having your own place to tell stories. How did that become about? And um, completely by accident, actually. It was, it, it was, uh, I went into animation, uh, you know, hoping to be an animator for the, my full career. And I think uh, if I had found, when I left Disney, uh, you know, someone in Europe who was, you know, telling great stories through animation, I would have just gone to see that person and said, let me lend my talent to your vision. And I would have been perfectly fine with that because that's what I love to do. But uh, I also realized that, you know, putting all your effort, animation is, is at its best when it's in the service of a great story. So, uh, you know, I, I found that I didn't want to put all that effort into stories that did not deserve that because you cannot save a film through animation. You know, uh, the story's there, it's not. So um, when I couldn't find that person, I said, well, I, mean, I, need, I need to fill that void. And I became the closest thing to that person I could become. Um, but it was uh, mostly because my, my belief has been like, there's really no point in, in getting yourself into these long, you know, huge projects with, with hundreds of people that need to participate unless you're gonna attempt to do something great. Otherwise, why would you do it, right? Um, so, and possibly fail, but at least you're gonna try, you know? So I, I landed on this uh, company and uh, uh, I was uh, very used to having my salary and I came to Spain and I started working for them as a creative director and uh, I thought that they were going to nurture me becoming that and it turns out they went out of business in like a couple of years and then um, they said hey we don't we cannot pay you but if you want to you know keep the four desks and two computers uh, and we'll sign the company over to you and then you can you know consider yourself paid that way and uh, I said well I never really wanted to run a company but we had a one year contract for a service work on, on that Asterix film. And I said, well, that's one year of oxygen. So maybe we'll find someone else to buy it out during that time. Because in my mind, I had to, there, someone else had to be responsible for me. <laughs> you know, like, like I couldn't just be an yeah. entrepreneur myself, you know. And then turns out after a while, that project finished and then we landed another job and it was, oh, maybe we can sustain ourselves, you know? So we learned little by little, we actually were adults and we had to be okay with being out there in the wild and take care of ourselves. And and uh, and it took a while to, to get used to the idea, but uh, at one point, then we had a small company and the opportunity to develop these ideas and to, you know, uh, try to get them out there. It's taken a long time to, like I said, get one picked up you know, and, and even longer to get one picked up that we could actually make in the studio. That was the first one was Klaus and it's been good 16 years, 16 years since we actually started. So um, I cannot say perseverance is, is uh, a sure bet, but you're definitely not going to get at any chance without at least, uh, you know, uh, sticking with it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the, the turns, the pivots, the uh, opportunities that came to you, this, it's interesting how that unfolded. Hmm. Um, you, you talked about heart and finding a story that has heart. Do you find now with what has unfolded with your studio, is that also where your heart is? Or are you, where are your, where is your heart in all of this? Do you, are you finding things within running a studio that you enjoy? or not <laughs> or do you want to keep free that yourself up to be at the at the desk and and design and draw and and 
tell yeah, stories? Yeah, that's always been a struggle. I mean, I, I, you know, an artistic mind is not suited to run a company. We're not good organizers, you know, and that's okay. But I've always been very aware of that because I've seen other small companies run by artists and why they end up not working out, you know. So I've tried to be disciplined about uh, that side of it, but it's a permanent fight in my head between the guy who says this can be better, you know, you can do a better job, and, and the other guy who says you already gone over budget, so you gotta be okay with it, you know. So, you know, there's this, this two sides of me, but I definitely, I am on that quest to find enough help so I can devote as much of my time to actually making films as I can, yeah. And team building then, speak a little bit about how you've shaped uh, the team that works with you and in order to permit you to do what you do. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's a tricky thing, team building, because you, it's, I find it to be a chicken and egg thing. You know, mm -hmm. you, you will attract artists with a great project, but you need great artists to put together a great project. <laughs> so you go, you, you build slowly and you are selective and you probably your first project is gonna be uh, whatever you work and maybe if you can spur uh, a few dollars you can hire a freelancer that you like and to do but but um, it's better to to show less but of high quality because you can get that would like to see more which is a good answer um, but I'm like, let's, well, you know, we have a lot. It's not all great, but that's what we got. So let's go with it. So, um, yeah, you, you have to build relationships little by little and people will want to work with you uh, eventually. Um, I find that um, Klaus, now after Klaus, probably your chances at, at accessing the talent we want will be better. Because yeah. at the time you're saying, hey, we got Netflix to, you know, fund this film a lot of people were like ah I, you've never done anything before where do you come from like like a lot of people say i'm not relocating for this company that who knows right which is fair uh but once again you 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 build it up you know uh i think the biggest um boost we got for recruiting a great crew on clouds was that teaser trailer that we did in 2015 that was meant to be a proof of concept for the for the producers um, but it turned out to be uh, a huge uh, pot of honey for artists who wanted to work in that right and uh, and I found that to be probably the, the biggest motivator for a crew to relocate to Madrid and come work on the film. And you also took a, an interesting approach with your uh, ultimate uh, team building on this film. You had uh, artists working remotely from all over the world. Talk a little bit about um, how you guys structured that, how you uh, approached, and I, I'm also fascinated with the fact that within your teams, within your crew, your creative crews, uh, where your numbers were, you had a, a majority of women working for you, is that correct? It wasn't quite a majority, it was close to uh, parity, close to it, but uh, what I'm most proud of is not really that, what I'm most proud of is that we um, we we only looked at the talent. We we never looked at the. I mean, I could have. We could have easily uh, done the whole hiring process without ever looking at anybody's portfolio picture or even knowing their name. And I assure you, we would have the same exact crew because we were just looking at who was best for the job. And and the fact that it turned out to yield almost parity is very satisfying. But I would have been perfectly fine if it had turned to be more women or more men, because because there's no bias in the selection process, right? So I think that's how we avoid that, you know. Um, but in terms of an international crew, we try to convince people to relocate as much as we could, because I do believe on the uh, there's a particular climate that born is born out of the people who share a space and uh, who feed off each other and challenge each other. And uh, if you can accomplish that healthy competition, you know, it's good. Uh, also, it's the share experiences that we carry with ourselves after the film is done. You, um, and I, I have long conversation with friends who are advocating the virtual studio, but I feel that I'm more comfortable working in a, in a brick and mortar space. Uh, with like, Now, having said that, we do have uh, people who we work with regularly and who are not working in-house, we try to fly them over 
every other month or so, at least for a week, so have some interaction. But that depends entirely on the person. Some artists do very well that way, and some artists actually are completely different when you're working with them directly from when they're working remotely. And there's a communication barrier that sprouts sometimes that you just cannot overcome. So we will always make exceptions and work with people remotely, but we will also always favor in-house uh, crew because we believe in that. And, and communication, I would imagine, is key in keeping your vision on track. Talk a little bit about some of the things you do to ensure that your, your teams, your, your creative staff, are, are continuing through with what your ultimate vision is, but then uh, obviously bringing their talents to it. How do you, how do you juggle that? How do you uh, well, ensure the course of that? I, I found that um, the, the way I understand storytelling and the way, because I was trained mostly in the U.S., um, it's, it's kind of uh, very different from what usually happens in Europe. So I'm investing uh, as much effort as I can into retraining people here because they there's a there's a culture that I guess I guess the the iterative nature of animation where you do several versions on a feature film until it becomes good right um, uh, European talent is not very used to that so they tend to let an auteur write script and whatever he says goes and that's that um, so it's been difficult to get a crew to understand that now once you get past the narrative once you actually figure out the solutions to the narrative problems then you cannot get a better artistic crew because once the vision is clear they will crystallize it into something amazing uh, so there's an incredible talent when it comes to visual development and, and animators and all that you know but I find that there's still a lot of work to be done in Europe towards training in story and the, the craft of story. Uh, because there's this, there's this idea that is just like, it's, it's, it's ethereal and subjective and anybody would do, but, but, but there's also a craft to be learned. And I say, okay, know the rules first, then you can break them. But there's a lot of people who go straight to breaking the rules that they never learn. So, you know, so uh, that's something I'm working on, but I, I have to say, so I feel like I am doing uh, a lot of work uh, before I can open it up to the crew and say, I have the questions and I have the answers um, because they're not in the best disposition to participate in that. And every time I try to open it up for brainstorming, they've been fairly lost in that world. Like, no, you tell me what you want me to draw. And I'll draw it. But so I, I am working on changing that mentality. So, so uh, everybody in the crew feels like they're part of telling the story a bit more, you know, but it's, it's an ongoing process. Bring, the, bring their ideas to the table as well. Right. You uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of your story mentors or uh, stories that resonate with you that you may not have, <laughs> you know, do what kinds of things do you, if we were to take a look at what sits on your nightstand for, for reading, if that's something you have time for, what kind of stories speak to you that, that also um, teach you the craft of storytelling? Right. Well, um, I, you know, I, I like simple stories. I really like stories with simple, clear statements, you know, like uh, uh, something uh, I always admire in terms of structure and, and clarity Dickens uh, and uh, 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 Christmas Carol is beautifully uh, structured uh, film is, is perfectly structured you know uh, I you know I studied some of the classics I read the three musketeers and I broke it down into a structure to understand how everything was done so I tried to go for and those are not in cerebral like I'm very mainstream in my text, you know, like, like you won't, you won't find me uh, uh, citing some obscure, uh, you know, French uh, uh, expressionist uh, filmmaker from the, from the thirties or anything like that. No, I, I am more, my taste is fairly mainstream and, and that's actually difficult to do. And I don't, um, I, I, I don't accept a director telling me I left it, uh, for the audience to figure out or to interpret. I don't accept that because 
only a few people can get away with that. And those are the people who have shown that they know the rules and they can actually tie the story to a nice bow and have everything work. And once you've proven you can do that, then you can choose to leave something untied. But if you haven't proven you can do that, that, that may very well be your way to avoid um, doing the legwork and actually, you know, cause it's not an easy thing to do to structure a story well and to make sure there's causality and cause and effect throughout it. And there's no, I guess the worst version of it, I can tell you, it's uh, I'm a big fan of horror films and uh, I rarely watch a good one, uh, but I watch almost all of them. Um, and, uh, but they all have that same scene where it's just like, I need to get to this moment, which is really scary. And somehow I need my, my character to get there and they rarely take the time to say, well, I need to exhaust every other option. Uh, so the audience feels the dread of like, oh, she has no chance, but no choice but to go in there. But you often have that character who hears a scary nose and goes to investigate and immediately go, well, she's dead and she deserves it and you're out. And, uh, and that's, but that's all, all screenwriting because the hardest thing to, 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 to write is the whys. Is you'll find yourself getting, you never get stuck with the what. You have plenty of ideas when it comes to the what. But the why this happens uh, is extremely difficult to do. And, and the audience will not forgive you for making your character stupid so you can get to that place that you want to get to. So. Do you find that your, your work in storytelling um, and as you, you cultivate and shape and formulate the story you're telling, is that a key part of what locks you into the vision? of the overall film or project that you're working on? Well, come back um, or is there? It's usually, it's usually a nice, interesting character arc. It's usually like, a, like a something that I go, okay, um, I, um, you know, I like the journey of like a super villain who doesn't care about anything but taking over the world to a father. I, I, I am interested in that journey. I want to break it down, you know? Um, how about, a, selfish brat who never spares a thought for anybody other than himself and who's going to learn the value of uh of giving and how much joy there is in giving i'm interested in that journey yeah so so those are usually the the broad strokes of what takes me you know gets me interested in that if that makes sense reversible change for your characters <laughs> yeah are there any, do you find as you're in the midst of this, as you're, as you're sort of working through in either in writing or in pre-production on a film and development on a film, there are discoveries that you're making along the way about the character you wouldn't have thought? Oh yes, 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 yes. Like I said, you, you sense there's a good story in there and you go and dig it out. And uh, along the way, you're gonna realize, oh, this is actually not about what I thought it was. It's actually even better you know, and, and stronger. And I can make this point even, even clearer, or there's a secondary character who, who, who can have an arc that supports my message in a different way. So yeah, there's, there's all kinds. So like, if you look at the first, um, the first pitch for, for Klaus, I mean, the intent was there, but it wasn't nearly as satisfying as a journey as, as the film ended up being, right? And that was how long of a journey? Clouds. Well, I mean, it was nine years old together, but it was on and off because we, I, I did write the treatment and I, and I put the pitch together and it kind of sat there for a couple of years because we were at the time working on small food. And then after that, there was a chance to, uh, you know, uh, do some development work, put the teaser trailer together. So we went and did that. And then we spent about um, almost a year shopping that around until Netflix finally said yes. And, uh, and then since the moment we got a green light, it was about two and a half years to actually make the film, you know, but, but yeah, you, you, that's when I say you need several projects because you, you never know when one is going to happen. You got to be handling several things at once. And when it, it's right already, then you jump at it. But, um, uh, but it's important, for example, no one forced me to, to uh, spend a good eight months writing that treatment and, putting a pitch together. There was no uh, business logic behind that. 
decision. Like it was, it was just like, I, I have this idea. I think it could be good one day. I don't know what to do with it right now, but at least I'm going to get it out of my head and ready, you know, and then we'll see what happens, you know. Again, it's that sustaining of that vision over time or obstacles or uh, other challenges that is remarkable. And I think uh, what sets you apart from other storytellers and filmmakers out there, and particularly in this industry. Um, I, Matt, I wanna open it up to some questions. Let's uh, see what we've got. Yeah, we got loads of questions in the chat. Uh, let's start from the beginning. Um, Kayla's asking, uh, knowing the competition you face as a new studio, was there any doubt that forming your own studio would work? What were you looking for that other studios couldn't provide? Oh yeah, there's tons of doubt. I mean, you don't, I mean, I think anybody who um, does, not, uh, does not realize that there's the chance of failure is always there. It's always gonna be there. You just gotta be okay with that, you know? But, um, uh, for every person that succeeds, there's going to be nine that don't. And that's just nature. And you might very well end up being one of those. doesn't even mean that's your fault. It just could be you just weren't bad timing, whatever. You know, so many things can go wrong. So many planets need to align for you actually to get to make a movie. And for it to be good, it's like even worse. You know, like like it, it it's really about uh, increasing your chances by, by sticking with it, you know. Uh, but but even then you may fail. Even then, and when you fail, it's it shouldn't be uh, the end of it. It should just be like, what can I learn from this? So when I try again, I'm better prepared for it, right? So um, I never did this because I wanted to have a company. The company was always a means to an end. Like if I actually want to live in Spain, where I was raised and raised a family here. Um, um, but I still want to make, you know, these uh, meaningful films that take a lot of money, a lot of people to make. How do I make that happen? And that's when having a, a facility and learning to come up with good ideas and learn how to present them. So it was all towards the same goal of like one day I'd like to make a film at my own studio and, and, and hopefully a good one. Uh, so you make those decisions along the way. One interesting thing is that you, you will have temptations along the way that will derail you from your goal. You know, you will, you will have, because we sustain ourselves through service work. Um, so, you know, you will get a job and, and, and most of the money you, you make on that job goes to just sustaining the operation. And then you maybe scrounge out 10% of it and you spend a couple months developing an idea. And that's your, that's all you can afford to do. And that's fine. Um, but, um, but you do that long enough and whenever a big job presents itself, you know, like at one point there was a big project, uh, big TV show, huge budget. And, uh, and we could have said yes and basically sustained ourselves for 10 years and made a killing. Um, but that would have meant very likely we would not get to make Klaus. And at the point we didn't have a yes for Klaus. We didn't even have a company that wanted it. So it took guts to, to say, even though I have no plan B, I know this takes us away from our vision. So we're gonna stick with it and hope for the best. But it's very easy to settle for the safe bet. Like, okay, that's easy money. And I'm gonna say no, it's actually uh, not an easy thing to do. And there's no guarantee when you make the decision that you're not delusional. You might very well be delusional. So, so all I say is, you know, you just try to stay sane and analyze the, the situation and, and make the best decision you can with, with the data you have at the time and never beat yourself up over making the wrong choice because that's what you knew at the time. So that's what you had to decide. Sometimes it's, doesn't always turn out to be the wrong choice. I mean, we got, look at where we got with Klaus. <laughs> it sounds like you made the right choice there. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I, I, we're not complaining. It worked out for us. But like I said, there's, this, this is not like the first attempt. Obviously, we faddle. There's a lot of heartache and doubt and, and times where we had to fall down on, and, and gather the strength to stand up again. I mean, I think probably the closest time we've come to giving up was... Um, when I left Smallfoot, Smallfoot was a project that I developed, the film that ended up being, has nothing to do with the vision that I had for the film. 
I lasted about two years trying to find a way to to get order to support my vision. Um, it wasn't happening. There were there were other people with a completely different idea of what the film needed to be. Um, I ended up jumping out and saying, "Look, you know, I I cannot be the person you used to destroy my own film." So. Good luck to you, and uh, and uh, and that's when I could have very easily said, I've tried enough times. I've seen my film get away from me so many times by now. Now it had been Smallfoot and Despicable Me, uh, even though Despicable Me turned out to be a good film, but I didn't get to make it. You know, somebody else did. So you're thinking, am I missing the writing on the wall? Should I just like say, okay, I've tried, I came close, but it's not meant to be. And it was only because that's when the, 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 the funds to develop Klaus into a teaser trailer and to explore, I, I, you know, they were lined up at that moment. I said, let me dive into that before I do something rush, like shutting the place down and see what happens, you know. But I came pretty close to saying, okay, maybe I need to, you know, be like some of my friends who are like very, doing very well being freelance artists themselves and they don't need to sustain a facility and a, and a crew and, and, and take on all that responsibility, you know. Um, and I would very much like to be one of those guys who draws for a living again. Uh, so, so, I mean, there's going to be temptations like that, you know. Well, but the team you build around you, I think, is is a strong one there to support you to be able to do that. You know, knowing where your strengths are and, and then uh, keeping yourself grounded in that. Um, Matt, let's field a couple more questions. I want to make sure we get our, our viewers' questions answered. Yeah, we have one from Beth here who says, who's asking, how do you get the motivation to keep working, especially in the faces, in the face of challenging uh, in working in 2D animation? Well, that's more of a, um, that's fueled uh, by, I, I don't mistake this for revenge. What I'm going to say is not revenge. It's not about, I've been mistreated, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking to get back at the people. No, it's not that. It's that all the reasons that I was given at the time for why all the studios abandoned 2D animation, I just did not agree with. I am sorry, but I was like, all these decisions were about like, based on things that I just didn't believe to be true. You know, I, uh, people uh, don't want to watch 2D animation anymore. It's like, really? Do you know that for a fact? Or do they not want to watch this 2D animation we've been giving them lately, which is extremely repetitive and archaic and, and nostalgic? Are you, you know for a fact that if you try something different, you wouldn't have a chance to get people interested again, you know? Um, to these more expensive, like no, it's not. That's that's something that I don't know who decided that. I think it's logic. They stopped doing to these, so it must be more expensive because <laughs> technology brings cheaper solutions usually. Well, that's not the case here. To these way more expensive, you know. I mean, it there's a. It depends on when you set the bar for quality. If you set the bar for quality really high then 2D is much more uh, uh, cost effective than 3D. If you're going for a low quality bar, you can you can fool the eye easier with 3D than you can with 2D. It's true if you're doing low quality TV shows that you're better off doing 3D because you can do more. But uh, when you're talking about high end quality, I just don't, I mean, the studios know it to be different. The studios will call us when they needed something cheaper, like we did like a, a, a you know, a, a Christmas, no, what was it? A Halloween special of the Smurfs, the, the 3D movie, and they wanted the, they, they couldn't, they didn't want to spend the money to do a, a 3D Christ, uh, Halloween special. So one of the characters bumped his head and he had a dream in 2D animation for the duration of the rest of it. Why? Because it's cheaper, you know? So, you know, that that I didn't agree with either. Um, and the advantages of three, and I don't believe that more realistic is better. I just don't believe that. You know, I think uh, realism is great for special effects. It can be great for offering a believable experience in video games or virtual reality. That's great. When we're talking about storytelling, if your story is better supported by realism, great. Is live action an option then? Because that's the logical option, right? And uh, you have no idea how many projects I reject when I 
run him through my own tests. And my own test is determined to decide if this movie deserves to be made and in what medium. And, uh, and oftentimes uh, the, the project will land into this needs to be live action. That's the best version of it. And then it goes into a drawer that I have where projects just sit there unless I want they decide to do live action, you know, but I will not force a project to be something that it doesn't want to be. So in order to do 2D animation, I need to find a story that's better told in 2D animation and Klaus felt right for that, you know, and now uh, because we're moving forward with other projects, I, I have to, and because we do want to continue to explore 2D animation, that means we're even more restricted. So there's even more ideas that I have to uh, discard uh, because they are not better told through 2D animation. But that's fine uh, because I find that uh, in the whole production of Klaus, I, there was never once where I was limited by the medium. There was never once anybody told me, we cannot do that. We cannot tell the story that way because we're limited by the medium. That never happened. So um, I feel just like there's strongholds for stop motion even today there should be strongholds for 2d animation and i feel like we're better suited to be one of those ourselves um and not to say we're gonna bring back to the to the status it was before but i think someone needs to keep advancing that art form and we want to continue doing that but i like that you've also utilized technology to expand to to sort of push the capabilities of uh, within 2D animation. Talk a little bit about that. Well, what's the point in making a movie we already made? Like, what what is the point in that? So, if, if, if this huge endeavor that's going to take hundreds of people, um, and, 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 and because we're so afraid of risk, and because we're so afraid of going into the unknown, we're not even going to give it a try, the moment we open ourselves to exploring other, immediately we were discovering things that we didn't think that would be possible and they were, just because we allowed ourselves to be open to that possibility. And also, um, we cater to the story. It's always like, what does this story need uh, for it to be the best version it can be? And even on the next projects, the same things that we learned on Klaus will not, not apply exactly because there are different stories with different tones and different genres, and they will need for us to continue to be open to developing all the ways of doing things uh, because we're pursuing the emotional experience we want to give our audience. That's the end goal, you know, storytelling is emotion. So uh, if I feel that I cannot convey the right emotion through to the animation, I'll abandon the project or I'll switch to a different medium, but I will not deserve the story and the emotional journey that it, it, that it should serve. All right, that makes uh, resonant sense. Matt, next questions. Okay, I know you've already touched on this a little bit, but Law from the chat says that they run their own commercial, their own small commercial animation shop. And I was wondering if you'd talk about the business side of running the studio, and if you have any advice on how to get clients for animated commercials or explainer videos. Um, we never done explainer videos. We've done commercials occasionally. We tended to gravitate towards uh, um, um, uh, feature work if we could get it because uh, of the, um, the commercial, um, the nature of being a commercial studio uh, prevents you from from venturing into other things because it's such a uh, um, day to day, you know, you gotta stay up, you gotta fight for clients, you gotta, you know, beat someone else to the punch, you gotta bid lower, you gotta, you know, it's a very um, cutthroat business. So we found that we didn't have a vocation to do commercials ourselves. And we were better off saying, let me see if I can get 20 minutes from that film and that's nine months of work. And in nine months I can, uh, you know, spare a little bit of time to do other things other than just, but if I have to deliver this commercially in six weeks, then that's all I'm doing. So um, if your if your uh, ambition is to break out of the commercial uh, business, I would advise trying to find longer formats if you can, you know. Um, quality is best. And, and once again, risk is something we are trying to avoid, but 
if you do a short film or your own uh, makeup commercial, your own like made up commercial, just something to showcase your ability as a creative and how that sets you apart from other people, how you have a particular sensibility, that will be what attracts people to you. If you have the same reel that everybody has, then you're going to be fighting with this in the same condition. So, uh, um, I will say that's about it. Like I said, I never intended to remain a, a service studio. This was a temporary thing. I'm not sure if you're, if the question is geared towards how do I break out of this or how do I make that successful? Cause those are two different answers entirely. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, next question, Matt. Oh, we have a question from Sylvester who asks, how do you win trust from your teammates and help them excel at what they do best, but still guide the team to the direction of your vision? Um, I think that they, um, they see someone who's entirely devoted to, to, uh, to this and who's willing to sacrifice. You know, they've seen me uh, spend every last dime you know, on, on, you know, something with the hope that it will become something else. They've seen me work late hours. They've seen me, um, sacrifice and slave over it because I, because I believe that there's something behind it. And they, by now have seen the, the, the fruits that the fruits that that yield can yield, you know, like if you actually stick to it, you know, but they also know how rigorous I am and how the money I am with myself on the projects we do. Um, there's nothing in my mind sadder than an artist who's working below his or her ability. There's just something really sad about that. The artistic uh, mindset should be about like, okay, I know I know how to do all that, but let me see and see what else I can learn that I don't know how to do yet. So it should be a continuous strive for knowledge and for ability and for discovery and, uh, and that's why you can never rest easy. I mean, how easy would it have been for us to say to Netflix, we are ready to do Klaus 2. We would be right in the easy life right now. It would be so easy. It would suck. I promise you that. But we would have had an easy ride out of it, you know. Um, but who wants that, you know. So, so we are once again in uncharted territory doing something that no one probably would dare to do. And, and it's scary and that fear is actually what fuels us to try and strive and we found that instead of avoiding the fear we need to embrace it you know no easy task um but i think that's what sets you apart uh from many um we have a, a terrific question i was noticing here andrew asks about what do you do if you're approaching a deadline for a project storyboards or or pitches or anything like that that uh, but you're stuck or uh, starting to doubt or, or to second guess your own ideas? What, any tips, thoughts? I find, I find that, you guys seen Shakespeare in Love, there was this character played by, um, what's his name? Um, Jeffrey Rush, who's the old, um, the, the guy who's been in theater all his life and then he has this recurrent gag or like uh, he always says you know this whole catastrophe is happening we we are missing our main actor and he said it'll be all right you know it's like how do you know it always is it's a mystery like like it's you know and and they find that's true with what we do too i mean yes you're gonna be stuck you're gonna stress out and you're gonna lose sleep over it and somehow it will come to you uh i would say don't despair sometimes it's better to walk away i'm not good at leading by example in this. Like if, if I spend a whole day hacking away at an idea and it's not working, I'll keep hacking away until I'm literally exhausted. I, even though I know I should, pro I just, you just want to feel like I want to do one right, nothing right before I go to bed, right? And, uh, and it's hard to break out of that. But man, sometimes it's getting that good night's sleep and coming back the next day and realizing how childless I was being last night. And let me try this from a different area. You're going to get there. What I'm saying is, you know, I can't say don't panic because I do panic. Um, maybe panicking is part of it. And, uh, but I've, I've never 
been in that situation and ever said, you know what, I was right. I never, I never broke out of that blockage. I, I got stuck and I never came out of it. No, you do come out of it. Something happens. You'll make it happen. Some element of trust there in, in your capabilities, maybe just staying where I like your approach of stepping away, reapproaching, fresh eyes sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's my advice. No, I don't practice it though. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's usually the case with most great, great mm -hmm. uh, geniuses here. Um, Matt, next question. All mm. right, next question. We have one from uh, Nalita. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, they say, I know sometimes working in projects can become stressful. What are, this, what are some fun activities you do with your team to bring them closer, up, closer together and keep the morale up? Um, I don't know that we have a long enough history to know that uh, because Klaus was, was a very tight schedule and it was really our only film so far. We've done parts of film, but we never done a whole film ourselves. So we scrambled to, you know, to find that. We, we, that, we tried things like, um, um, I remember there was a pressure to uh, get the quotas up. The animation team was not getting the quotas, and, uh, mostly because um, um, they were too exigent with their own work. There's like, we're working on the film and I see what everybody else is doing. I don't want to be any less than them. So people were overworking. Um, and in exchange, we were getting great quality, but at the same time, the numbers were low. So we're just like, how can we get them to? So there was a long conversation about how do we get the team to go faster? And uh, and you know, um, the obvious re the obvious thing is like more hours, you know. And 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 I rarely ask for more hours. I always say, um, you know, we're asking. You know what our standards of quality are, and you know what a quantity is, which is reasonable. So it's up to you to find how you make that happen. You know, if you're if you're um, putting too much pressure on yourself, then you're responsible for that extra time. You know, uh, if we're putting that pressure, then we are responsible for that time. So it's it's you know let's let's keep it simple. But the conversation was about how do we make it go faster. And I at one point said, you know what, we we are talking about all the things that incentivize speed. And we're not spending enough uh, effort into uh, incentivizing the quality and, and being grateful for the quality we're getting. So I think this is the wrong approach. So I said, we need incentives in both areas. So, you know, for each department, we asked the supervisors, what would be the right incentive? It turns out for, uh, for animation, it was, uh, we had the shot of the month where we would select uh, the best shot that we thought was produced every month. And then they would vote who they thought the winner is and the winner would get a sketch from me and we would have like a happy hour and then they deliver the present and uh, and uh, and uh and in addition to the bonuses on productivity you know for um for uh backgrounds it was that didn't work for them but they preferred to you know have us print the best background each month and put it on the wall and, uh, and showcase it for a whole group to see and then that's what we did so we try to uh keep it uh, interesting that way we didn't really have a lot of time to to spend in in uh you know uh outings team building uh, because we were against the clock you know the whole time so that's still left to be built upon in the future i know that the team themselves uh, you know, they, they, they got really tight. They were, you know, friends for life kind of thing. So we didn't have to get involved in that. The company is not needed for that. Uh, so, and, and many of them, you know, will cherish the experience. We know that for a fact, but, but we do have plans for the future. I don't think we have achieved that. I mean, the normal things, you know, um, you you would have the the happy Fridays. You would have the you know outings, and you would have a screening halfway through the movie. Those things we do, but we don't have anything particular to ourselves that only we do. You know. Talk a little bit about some of the challenges or experiences you've had with um, maintaining quality, uh, pursuing quality against the deadlines and against the. Uh, numbers and, and other challenges that would fray away at your quality? I have, I try to be, I think that um, that experience of having to 
having had to run a studio all this time uh, has taught me the discipline of deadlines and budgets. And uh, so that's what created that conflict between the artist and the entrepreneur, you know, and where I kind of have this, um, I would like to say balance, but it's really more of a battle. <laughs> um, uh, I, I give myself hard deadlines. Uh, there's always that this part is not working and someone needs to come up with a good idea to fix it. And I've asked everybody around me and they, none of the ideas that they give me uh, seem to work. Uh, so it's up to me to figure it out. And I will, if I can do that, uh, but I will always uh, be very conscious that on, there's a deadline. And on that date, the best solution we have, even if it's not the, the least bad one, that's the one that goes, even though I know that the following day I'll have a better one. And I have to be very strict with myself that way. So if that's the best solution, that's the best we have. Oftentimes, like I said before, you get unstuck in the last minute and you figure it out and something happens, right? Yeah. But I would not, um, we, we, I felt we were going to have to compromise quality a lot more as things came along and we never had to and we were fortunate that way, but we were ready to do so if we had to because not delivering is never an option, right? Right. right. I used to joke with my crew that come the deadline, we were going to deliver 90 minutes of something. <laughs> you know, we let's see what it is. But <laughs> therein is the mystery, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are days, there are times. Um, you know, you you talked a bit about um, these challenges and and sort of sustaining yourself through that. Do you? Uh, the team that you surround yourself with, you, you go to them for advice, for thoughts. I mean, uh, others beyond who are maybe outside of the project that you seek uh, input? Yeah, I, I do. Like I said, I have trouble finding support on the narrative side internally. Uh, there's good friends that I uh, will pitch to and, and run ideas by. And uh, um, I, I, at one point, we... We had to rewrite uh, all of Act One because the character of Jesper wasn't working, and uh, Gene, our producer, set us uh, set me up with a small brain trust of you know people who I uh, known or worked with, and uh, she made it happen. Like 24 hours later, I was in a restaurant having lunch with these guys, exposing my problems and seeing what the solution could be. And sure enough, one of them came up with the right solution. You know, so you're not gonna. I'm not on my own. Uh, but I, but I am still looking for that ideal partner that I can have in house, you know. Uh, uh, so that's still uh, something that um, hopefully will happen for the next time around, you know. Otherwise, it seems like there's um, it's a high risk if you if all the narrative solutions need to come from the same place. Uh, should I be get sick or something that puts too much strain on it? And also, I cherish the 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 um, the social and common experience and the brainstorming and I am hoping to be able to replicate it here one day. Mm. Yeah. yeah, a combination of the Roy to Walt Disney, <laughs> yeah. balancing with your Roy, but also uh, that brain trust of, of talent and minds and, and mm. go-to sources. That's a sure. treasured thing. Um, Matt, uh, continued questions, because I want to get these in. We have so many great questions going by. Uh, here's a question from Alan, who's asking, for the artists who continue to train in their animation and designs, is it best to focus on one specific position or generalize all? For example, 2D, 3D animators, storyboard artists, character designer, and more. Well, my advice is I know very few people that can do all of that. I think it's great to do a short film because it allows you to be in touch with the whole process of it, you know, uh, even if it's like a 30 second thing, but it's good to know all those things, you know. But I would advise you to not be only good at one thing, but not only try to be good at seven, because that's just too difficult, you know. Um, I would say uh, a start, a great start would be try to be very good at something in pre-production and something in production. Right. Try to be very good at either character design or storyboarding or, or visual development, for example, you know, and also good at background painting or or um, or 
animation, may that be 2D or 3D animation or something, but knowing something in both pre-production and production means you likely being played all the time because you never know what kind of work that's gonna come. And if you work in a small company that doesn't have the luxury of having continuous production, you know, if you are an expert in something, that means, okay, so you're an animator, but at the end of the film, I, I only have pre-production work until we do the next one, so I have to let you go. You know, so it's very hard for you to stick with the same company if that's something you wish to do. Um, so I would start with two disciplines and then build up from there. And uh, you can get pretty good at four or five of them, but uh, I'm not sure that that should be your goal. You know, I, I, I think if you're good at a couple or three things, um, but really good at those, you're fine. I always say, um, had I stick, had I stuck with character design, I'd be better today. But all the hours that I didn't put into it because I was doing other things means I'm not as good as I could have been. You know, um, and uh, and that's a shame. But you choose your path, and and uh, it's a it's a matter of how many hours you put into something. You gotta get better at it. You yourself are kind of a one man band, and in. in uh, the areas you've worked in and, and certainly in building the studio. Um, uh, are you focused on the areas that you want to be focused on? Are there other areas uh, within the creative process that you prefer to be uh, spending? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I, I am now working on the next project. And it's a struggle because um, I, I am the one who has to write the story and figure out the things and have at least the structure and treatment that everybody else can follow. Uh, but at the same time, I am jumping in to help with character design if my character design is struggling to the tone of what I'm thinking. But I never jump in long enough to really get to enjoy it. It's just like, uh, here's a sketch and then you go have all the fun now. And, uh, and then uh, I will jump in and uh, help with the illustrations that will go along with the beat board and I'll do a quick sketch. And, but I, I feel like I'm not servicing any of those areas enough. Like I'm having to do everything, but I'm not really doing one thing right. Uh, so it's not, it's not as satisfying as I wish it were. Um, the truth, as I told you before, is that if, if I could have, you know, there's this writer who gets asked the question, do you love to write? And he answers, I love to have written. Yeah. Uh, and and that's that's how I very much feel about that process of writing. I, it's, it's a grueling uh, process filled with doubt and, 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 um, and frustration. And uh, it's not enjoyable. It's great once you've done it, but it's not fun to do. I really wish it was someone else doing that. And I was one of my guys just waiting for this guy to figure out so I can do my drawings, you know? It's a lot easier. <laughs> so so I, don't, I don't particularly enjoy the process. I do enjoy if we end up with something great. Um, but man, I really, I really, I really wish there was someone else doing this so I could just go work for that person. <laughs> <laughs> Until that comes. Um, Matt, let's go with the next question. Yeah, we have a question here from Eduardo who's asking for other animators who want to become ahead of their own studio, how easy or how hard was it to make that transition from animator to head of a studio? <laughs> It was hard, and like I said, you you there were, like no one prepares you for it. No one tells you about like all these taxes you have to pay for, and what you know how to save for a rainy day, and what happens you know when uh, uh, unexpected things like the machine broke down and we don't have funds to replace it, and all that. You know, I mean, there's there's so many. I mean, what I'm trying to say is, uh, yeah, you learn the basics about entrepreneurship, but like for a small company, I think you should do that. You know, so at least you have. Um, somewhat of a knowledge of you know what running any company implies you know uh but then the rest of it and the nature of a studio and the nature of your studio will be different from mine and you're gonna have to learn through trial and error and, and be okay with that if you're one of those people who doesn't want to learn the business side of things and you see an opportunity for a partnership with someone who does I'm not saying partnership always good, like they, most of them don't work, but if you find the right person who actually thrives on this business side of things and allows you the time to focus on the creative side of it, I would encourage that. 
but in my experience, good partnerships usually are born naturally, like people who already are friends and fit well. Is you don't put an ad for a partner. Don't ever do that. You know that's <laughs> not gonna work. You know? <laughs> And be prepared for the long haul, correct? It's, it's not a short-term process. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I would, based on what you've been discussing, um, there's a lot of uh, hills and peaks and valleys and, and uh, roads to traverse. Each project bringing new challenges, new, new directions, new uh, obstacles and new rewards. Um, let's talk a little bit about your own life experiences and how they weave into your creativity um, and your family. I know that's quite important for you as well. Um, is that a big part of what drives you, sustains you, um, inspires you? Well, I mean, um, Marissa, my wife, is also a part of the company and uh, we tried to keep it separated for a long time. Like the first 10 years I had the company, I was, I was, uh, my parents used to work together and it was not good because they could never turn it off. They could, they will always go home and keep bickering about work. And I did wanted to avoid that. And then one day I just couldn't afford to avoid it because she's a very capable person with experience and an MBA and all that. And I was really drowning in my own company. So I come help me out. And then what she did, I could not, ever you know let that not be there because it was a, such a relief you know and then she's more business-minded than I am so but we found ways to keep it separated where she's like handling like most days we don't see each other until we get home you know it's uh um, so it's fine and we have two kids and uh, I mean I I am not one of those guys who tell stories about his own experience right like that I do want my kids to enjoy what I do, but I'm not one of those people who will test my ideas with my kids and whatever they say, because every kid is different. And one of the worst things that I've experienced is when you have that one executive who will test the film you're working on with their kids and whatever their bratty kid said, you actually have to do now, uh, even though they're maybe just like they were just gassy that night. You know, I mean, you don't know, you know, it's so random, you know, and I will not impose that on my own projects. Like I, I would like to know what my kids think of it, but some films that I do are probably not meant for them and they may hate them and that's fine. You know? um, but uh, the funny thing is my little one is now nine and he was, uh, he was uh, born just about when we started working on this story. So as far as he knows, since he's actually known what I do for a living, we've been working on Klaus. So if you asked him, Last year, what does that do for a living? He will say, Klaus. He does Klaus. That's what he knew, right? And then when we told him we finished the film, he was like, what are we going to do? Like, like, he actually thought like that meant we had no job like, all of a sudden, right? So that's how long these things take, you know? Yeah. Um, but I do, I do, I do, I'm not saying I do try to keep them separated, but I don't think that my home life and my work life are one and, and, and a single one, they're separated. Mm -hmm. And a big part, I would imagine, of what sustains you through the challenges at the world. Yeah, I mean, look, um, it would have been so much easier to just stay in the California. When, we, when I left Disney, uh, it would have been easier. Um, I was a, a respected, artist i could have easily you know kept getting work um rates were higher we could have raised the family there you know the whole point of this was like i was raised in spain i want to uh my kids to be close to their grandparents and all that so we decided that but at the same time i want to you know be able to make big movies you know and that's like there's no precedent for it there's like nobody's gonna say oh just like that guy no there's not that guy you're trying this for the first time and you're likely gonna fail um but um giving up or failing and having to move my family back to la was something i didn't want to do at the time and i think that uh once they're old enough to actually have an identity i think that's actually a good thing but or, uh, we didn't want to do that early so the inspiration was trying to you know keep my family the life that they would deserve regardless of what I wanted to do my, with my life, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, and you've, in the process of doing that, you've uh, 
blazed a remarkable trail that I think m many of us can uh, certainly find inspiration from. Um, and speaking of that, uh, Matt, uh, additional questions. Here's a question from Beth in the chat, who's uh, wondering if, for feature, if the pipeline for 2D and 3D are pretty much the same, or how different are they? Um, the 2D pipeline is different. Uh, it's simpler, usually. Um, I'll tell you, the best way I can describe it is, um, it's a mindset. Uh, someone who's devoted his or her life to getting good at drawing or painting, um, whenever a problem presents itself, the go-to solution for people who, uh, who are wired that way is paint it better, draw it better, right? That's, uh, uh, and, and for those people, and, and I am one of those people, uh, when, when there's a problem, the solution is within you. You can raise to the occasion, become better artists and fix the problem, right? Uh, I did train myself in CGI. I did not make the decision to not work in CGI without understanding what I was given up. So um, what I learned from it was that the problems were external to me. Uh, I, there's nothing I could do. If the rig didn't work, I had to call the rigger to fix it. If, uh, you know, I, was, I, I, I wasn't getting better by overcoming these problems because they were external uh, limitations. I was not getting better as an artist, you know. I feel very comfortable with that idea that if I want this to be good, I just have to become better at what I do. Uh, I'm not saying that's better. I'm saying that there's certain people who are wired that way. And those people were better in traditional animation because it's about the challenge of becoming better at what you do. There's less technology and less variations involved in that. And oftentimes the solution is just, you just gotta take a look at it and handle it better, right? And, and I, I'm comfortable with that challenge. Uh, does it mean it's better? No, it, it means it's different. And you have to decide what, you know, think of it as a painter who decides to use a favor oil painting over watercolors or flash, you know, it's just a tool you choose because you're more comfortable with it. That's it. Next questions, Matt. Hey, here's a question from Sylvester. Uh, any advice for a storyboard portfolio who wants to apply at Spa Studio someday? <laughs> um, just, just know that if your work is uh, good, if you blow us away with your work, we'll, we'll um, spare no effort in getting you over here, no matter where you're from. I mean, if, if uh, um, I mean, timing is an issue. Like right now, we're not hiring animators because we're between projects. But you know, when we were hiring for Klaus, like whoever sprouted, you know, regardless of the level of experience and uh, regardless of their nationality. You know, I would just go to my producer and go, we, we need this person here, you know? And it's like, well, you know how long it's gonna take to get a visa for Cambodian citizens? I, I don't care that we, you know, it, it will, it will be, believe you me, once this person's here, we're going to be glad we did, you know? And every time it was the case. And uh, so whatever you put in your portfolio, um, don't do flashy for the sake of flashy. I would say always show what you can do for a story. Like like show, you know, like if, if the story point is this, here's how I use my art to convey that emotion. Like here's how I support this, you know. So flourish is nice as an addition, but don't just show flourish. Just make sure that you, you uh, come to us as a storyteller, regardless of what you do, right? Uh, if you're an animator, you're still a storyteller. If you're layout, you're still a storyteller. You know, any of those professions are about telling a story. So we want to see how you do that. If you have a particular style or strength, make sure you showcase it, you know, and make sure you show only your best work. Don't, volume is not what you're going for. Just, uh, if you show us a, a 30 second reel, but it's good, will say we'd like to say more if you show us those 30 seconds of good work and you add a whole bunch of work that you're not so proud of we may go well this guy's is consistent and let's better wait right so i don't know if that helps do you do you prefer to see material that is akin or in line with what you're currently working on or uh do you want to see something completely different that expresses a, a direction you may not have 
No, look, whatever you choose, like even if it's a compression style, you know, but you're showing like, you know, I'm talking, I know, I know I'm talking about animation. There's many disciplines, you know, but I mean, uh, we've seen reels for storyboard for, uh, storyboard is particularly tricky because you are as good as your ideas. And I, I am not easily impressed by your ability to do camera flyovers, you know, that doesn't matter if you cannot tell a story. So story artists usually get a test from us because we actually want to see how you solve problems. And, uh, and uh, no matter how cute your, your sketches are, you know, and sometimes they're gorgeous, you know, if you cannot solve problems, then that's not, you know, gonna help us uh, do this thing. So, um, but for animation, for example, I don't care if the reel that you show me shows a completely different style. It still shows your ability to draw and, and to um, animate and to perform. So I think, uh, no, we would not limit ourselves to something that looks just like what we're doing because it's hard enough to find talented people as it is. So why would we do that to ourselves? Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Uh, Matt, more questions. Uh, you've talked a lot about, you know, story and, and learning proper story structure. Um, Beth from the chat wants to know if you would say that you're required to take screenplay writing courses before you work on writing your own works. Uh, it's not a, require, a requirement. I never take a script writing course. I, I did take a story class. In, it was part of my training at Calars. It was very basic, you know. Uh, I think it's good to know, but there's so much information online right now that you know, it's, it's so much more than what I got at Colors. You know, what I got at Colors was just the initiation of what a character arc is and just basic, very basic stuff, which you can find easily online. I have learned, I'm not discouraging you from taking script writing classes either. I think if that's something that works for you, you should. Um, what worked for me was when I first decided to get into storytelling, up at that point I had been mostly an animator and a character designer, so I never really had to deal with story. Other than the you know water cooler conversations that you have, oh, I, I don't like that, I could have done better, that sort of thing where everybody has a better story than the one you're working on. Um, but uh, that's cheap and easy to do, to criticize others without really getting your feet wet, you know? So, um, so when I started, what well, the first thing I did was like, let me go back and, and start looking at all the films I love and, and trying to understand why I love them and try to actually get conclusions and understand you know, what works. Also, let me look at films I hate and let me understand why I hate them and why they don't work and why, and I actually find that it's a far more useful exercise to, to watch bad films. Not just to watch them, but to actually understand why they're bad and also try to fix them. And that's when you really learn about problem solving because you'll go in and you'll say, well, that was sad and you, you'll have a laugh and that's fine, you know, but what I usually do with my friend, we'll go watch that movie, then we'll go grab dinner, we'll fix the movie if it can be fixed or if we can figure it out, you know, but then you're exercising that muscle and, uh, and, uh, and storytelling is all about problem solving. It's, it, that's all it is. You want to go from A to B, and there's all these questions about how would that happen and why and how, how was the cause and effect that the audience will accept here and how do I make it entertaining? And, and um, um, you know, you, you, you're gonna have to write from a um, placeholder system where you use devices that are tried and true on them, you know, defaults, not whole, uh, banana peel, you know, those things that are like, they do the function that you need them to do, but they're just there until you come up with something better. And the, 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 the medal of you as a storyteller is how different and original the final solutions will be to that. Give some examples of these. Uh, we have plenty of bad examples, and I think that's a strong hmm. uh, point to make about uh, learning from them. But um, give us uh, one or two examples of, of good stories that you you've sought out that, that inspire you, filmmakers or storytellers that. Okay. Um, I was talking about scary films earlier. Huh. Uh, I find that scary films are easy to use as examples because they exacerbate all these lessons. They're, they're really the same thing, but to the extreme, right? But the same things plague other bad films. Um, 
there's uh, the subgenre of the haunted house movie, right? The haunted house movie always has the same sequence. They all, all these films have a sequence. That's when the characters know there's something very wrong with this house. There's a killer clown in the attic, right? We know that. We now have all seen it and we know there's something very wrong with this house. But we need, the writer needs to give him a reason not to leave the house because any sane person would just, you know, yeah. <laughs> get the hell out of there, right? So, um, and, and almost every single writer fails at this because they resort to a uh, discussion about the mortgage. Like we can live right now, not in this economy, like dude, killer clown. Like that's not, you know, I mean, come on, right? So, and, and that's where the movie falls apart. Like every haunted house movie almost falls apart at that point, you know. Uh, the only one that did succeed with flying colors for me was Poltergeist. Mm. because Poltergeist was about a little girl who was taken by the house yeah. and no parent would leave that house right. and I buy that you know and they send their other kids away to keep them safe so that logic of that movie stands up even though you know a lot of it's now ho hokey but but still as a movie it's, it's you know they took the time to get me to believe that a person would act this way and most Movie. Once again, it's the why that gets you every single time, you know. Yeah. So that's just one example. Oh, that's a great one. Strong example. And Poltergeist still stands that test of time. Yeah, mm -hmm. considered a classic. Spielberg at his best. Matt, right. uh, let's continue with questions. I want to make sure we get everybody in as much as we can. Uh, here's a question from Kayla, who is asking, what percentage of your crew, of your crew works virtually versus in-house? And is there any advantage to working in-house that can't be dismissed? Oh, I think there's an advantage. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I worked virtually before and uh, I find that I don't have the temperament for it. You know, I, I, I require the constant, um, not validation, but at least I, I you know, I, I want someone to look at my work and give me pointers and, and show me what they're thinking or how they would solve this and all that. I benefit immensely from that. Um, I feel that legends are born in absence. Uh, if you watch someone's work who you never met and the work is great, you will think that person is superhuman. You will think that person is like, he's just not, that guy's not from this world. You know, all I've seen in his work, when you first meet that person, you are shaking and you go, I can't believe you're an actual person, right? Uh, but if you actually work side by side with a person and you run into him in the restroom and you go have lunch with a person and you realize they're human like me and they struggle and they have bad things like me, then it humanizes them and it means you can also get that good. And it opens that door for you as well, you know, because it's not superhuman anymore. So I think I, once again, the best experiences I've had in my life are from working alongside other artists in the space and i wouldn't trade that uh that's just me i'm not saying that's good for anybody um if you work on clouds remotely you would still get to work in the film but you wouldn't get that side of things you know and if you talk to anybody who was part of the team in house they would probably tell you um that they can't wait to get back <laughs> and we're trying to make it happen as soon as possible and that they made some of the best friends ever you know now in terms of monetarily, uh, you know, rates depend on where you're in, you know, on what your own rates are. So I wouldn't say there's an advantage of working remotely or in-house. It depends entirely on what the position is and what the responsibility is. Um, you cannot have a supervision job if you're working remote. We, we, if, you, if you're going to be leading teams or taking more responsibility or you hope to advance in your, you know, uh, level of responsibility, you will have to be here because you have to have face time with your crew, right? So those are the advantages I can tell you. Now, working remotely, clearly you know what the advantages are. And there's people who have, like Matt Williams was a good example of somebody who stayed in Oregon the whole time and got to supervise his own little character. Mogens was all his work, you know? And, um, and he got to be part of the film. But if you ask him, he would have loved to spend more time here, you know? Um, so I think it's a matter of, I think some people thrive in working remotely and that's fine. 
I'm not one of those people and I don't think that's a space I want to create around spa studios because I believe in there's something special about the uh, working together with teammates for a long period of time um, that not only benefits the work but your relationships too. Community, the importance of community for sure. Um, and is that a big part of what is ahead for spa studios? <laughs> I can't tell you much. I uh, can tell you that I'm working on two projects. Uh, we are trying to build a slate uh, because uh, we, we thought, we knew going in that Klaus was going to be followed by a slow period because we were not investing in, uh, not money, but actual time into developing anything to come after that. As I said, I'm I'm the only person developing ideas inside of the studio right now, which is something we're trying to change. We should have more than one creative head and we're working on that. Uh, but right now we want to build a slate. So I am working on two ideas. We hope a third one will come from elsewhere and, and, and have that slate because we're trying to, once we get back into production on the first film, we would like to offer our team the security and the stability of at least three films in a row. So uh, uh, we cannot expect our crew to be nomads and come back whenever we actually have work. So we're trying to make it happen. You know, uh, In terms of what they are, I can tell you what they are. I can tell you this, that they're all, they're both 2D because I found two ideas that I think actually benefit from that. Uh, they're as different from clouds as you can imagine and as different from each other as you can imagine. They're different genres and tones all together. Uh, Klaus does not represent the house tile in any way. Klaus was uh, basically trying to say, what's the perfect Christmas movie and what's the closest we can get to that perfection? And once that's done, that's done. And then uh, the next movie is going to have a completely different tone. But I guarantee you it's gonna be unexpected and it's gonna be something that will at least intrigue you. You'll want to see what it is and what we did with it because you've never seen anything like that before. You know? I'm sold. Cannot wait. <laughs> in the meantime, let's get back to a few more questions. I want to fit in as uh, much as we can here in our remaining time. Here's another question from Sylvester. I was asking if you have any advice for aspiring directors that they should keep in mind. What do you wish you knew earlier? Um, yeah, no, I think it's all about storytelling. Uh, like I said, I mean, uh, to me, being a director, well, I, I guess the, the one I would say is the we always talk about the importance of communication, but, and, and you will agree with that, you know, but then when you actually have to deal with what it is, you know, it will still surprise you because it's, it's, there's an endless way in which your, the way you convey your idea can be misinterpreted, misconstrued, or, 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 or washed away by a filter that somebody brings with them, right? So um, it's been always shocking when I would brief to a point where I say my description was so detailed, there's no way that anybody would misunderstand what I intended to. And then you go, oh, well, they found a way. You know, there's, there's like, so there's, um, whatever you can do to improve your, your, uh, your ability to communicate. And a lot of times it's not even about talking about describing what you want exactly, but like it's about giving like a picture, you're eating an ice cream and this happens. That's what I want you to, I want you to convey here. Like yeah, a lot of times it's more about subjectivity than it is about describing what it is, you know. But yeah, you'll never fall short um, of running to communication problems. So I, I, I try to brush up on those skills as much as you can, learn what works. If it's easier to do a sketch than it is to spend half an hour with somebody trying to describe it, uh, that's good. And it goes both ways. You also have to carve out the time and your schedule as a director is going to be extremely locked. You still gotta carve out the time to get some feedback back. You wanna hear ideas and you wanna hear what the audience, um, will take away from the film, you can already predict by asking your crew. You know, uh, I've never seen a film that a crew hated working on that people loved and neither the other way around. So listen. Great advice. Next question, Matt. 
Yeah, there's a question in the chat from uh, Raven who's asking, you know, you're talking about uh, communication. How do you settle arguments within your studio? Um, arguments are usually, um, there's usually a, 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 an emotional reason for arguments and anger comes from a sense of injustice. Even the angriest people who would like uh, re have a bad day and kick a few chairs and all that, you dig in and you feel that they feel like they've been mistreated and hurt. And um, so you take the time to listen to that, you know, and sometimes, yeah, then just look, there's, uh, there's people who are logical and there's people who are logical. And when you run into people who just not listen to reason, sometimes you just gotta, you know, I mean, I've had to lay people off that didn't fit. Um, that happens sometimes, you know, in a crew of almost uh, over 300 people, probably we laid off like seven or eight people that, and I think that's a pretty good rate, you yeah. know, because not everybody's going to fit, you know. Um, um, I think the key to whenever there's, uh, there's uh, misunderstandings or, or confrontations is to take the time to listen to all parties. And usually there's a solution to it. And usually people who've had those experiences were pretty bad about them and they want to move past them anyways, right? So uh, there were things that we couldn't anticipate. I remember there was this conflict that was that came out of nowhere for me. And uh, it was, uh, the, our studio is located in a, um, in a small um, area that's pretty remote it's a residential area and it has kind of a business center inside of it uh so and we're in the business center and uh, it has public transportation it has buses every 20 minutes and i thought that would be enough but it turns out that when we the crew started getting bigger i i would drive by the bus by the bus stop and i would see a long line of people mostly our crew waiting for the bus i was like and knowing that they're not gonna be in one bus so they're gonna have to wait for the next one so there was a big bottleneck when it came to, um, and I came back to the studio and I talked to my producer and I said, is there any money in the budget for, uh, you know, having a shuttle to come from downtown? Because this is, I mean, this is not good. I mean, the people are wasting so much time there and it's just grueling to, to get out of work, you know, every day. So um, they moved some money around. They found a way, they sacrificed all the things so we could have the bus and we could only afford one bus to on the way over another one on the way back so we set it at uh, 7 30 which was the time where most people were leaving the studio anyways and then that was fine and then later and the intent was once the studio was the movie goes into crunch time we'll have to extend the the time so the bus will uh, probably have to leave the student at 8.30 to accommodate everybody who's going to be working late and we thought no more of that and it's fine you know and then the day came and we made the change and we had a mutiny in the studio because what was now it has a, it was a right that we were tampering with and uh it was uh it was such a heated discussion that we ended up saying okay well you know we'll have to take money from somewhere else and then you know the movie will suffer any somewhere else because there's a limited amount of money we cannot make new money right and then have a second shuttle because Clearly, that was more important to to our crew than all the things. So you you can't predict what's gonna be that important, but it turns out that bus was very important, and we couldn't have anticipated that. Magic discoveries you make along the way. Um, you talked a lot about when you're teaming up, looking at the artistry and what talent brings to it. What about personality? Is that what, how does that factor into the choices you make with your crew? Well, I mean, uh, uh, some of the people we work with, we had already worked with and we would know temperaments and sometimes we would find, oh, this guy is actually a great leader, you know, and then we would promote that person to be more of a mentor to others, you know, and sometimes people we thought because of their long experience would naturally be good leaders, wanted nothing to do with wasting so much time as according to what I'm wasting so much time with my crew, you know, because they wanted to be left alone to actually do the work themselves, you know. Like, well, you don't want to supervise; you just want to, you want the the race and the and the and the title, but you don't want the responsibility. So, uh, so we have to move things around based on that. Uh, yeah, there were temperaments, and and and, and I myself uh, had to, you know, check myself during the film because the stress I was put under was. Uh, 
uh, was uh, quite uh, uncanny. And oftentimes I felt like no one's walking in my shoes for a whole day. They're all kind of taking their chunk on me, uh, but no one's actually seeing what it, this is doing to me. Uh, so I felt I was very alone and like, like I need someone to actually, you know, uh, look at this from my point of view and realize that I'm not an, an exhaustible resource and I need breaks and I need to have time to think and I, I'm just not an approval machine, which I was being looked at at one point, you know. Um, and there were absurd things like, uh, uh, yeah, we know you're writing the script, but if we give you time to write, then who's doing approvals? I was like, if there's no script, what movie are we making? You know, so so it's some very absurd situations. Um, uh, I can say, I mean, we did the best we could. There were definitely difficult times. Every movie has. There's no movie that just goes smoothly. Um, I cannot say I have made any enemies uh, or that anybody has like lost good old time friends over this. So I think we did okay, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, um, uh, temperament is something you cannot see in a portfolio. You just gotta react when they join and we just see how they work with the team, you know. And moving forward and uh, building on that, what kind, how will that shape these next projects as you're building your team and and uh, obviously keeping in mind the uh, talent that you've worked with, but um, as you're looking for new reviewing, new materials, new portfolios, mm -hmm. um, have you, have you, are you keeping any of that in mind or? No, what we've done is, uh, like I said, we've identified a few roles which are impossible to uh, predict. Uh, you know, through just portfolio reviews. So there's a few roles we would now require a test. Like there will be, like there's going to be a test period before you relocate uh, for both you and I to figure out if we are a good fit for each other. And it will be um, either uh, if we can make it short and painless, great. If it needs to be longer, it'll probably be a paid, paid test period. You know, but we need to know because the pain of figuring out you're the wrong fit after you relocate your family is just not it's completely unfair. So uh, uh, that's what we try to do. But there's always going to be a risk that you interview somebody and it seems right for the part. And then once they're here, it turns out not to be. And we just basically don't have a, a solution for that. We'll just keep reacting the best way we can as, as things come. I, I, I really wish there was a, a, a personalities we could deliver. I just don't believe that thing exists in a way that's reliable. Other than come here and let's see how it works out. You know? Yeah. Matt. Uh questions I think I might have reached the end of uh, the pressing questions here in the chat Wow but if I missed <laughs> it you know make sure to, to drop it again actually maybe. there's a couple that I put in your Skype uh, Matt at the bottom this is this last one that I find interesting actually yeah how do you deal with artist anxiety and the imposter syndrome artist face while working in the studio um, I usually uh, do periodic, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, talks with the studio where I'll pitch the movie and there will be several locations in which I'll go or I'll give a talk on a specific uh, subject like, you know, acting for animators or like storytelling and all that. So, and whenever that happens, I usually make sure to drive that point home that you're amongst your own kind right now and uh, that you're always going to be feeling that way and I feel that way and I remember Glenn Gillen telling me he felt that this is the day where they all find out I'm a fraud you know everybody has that so to, to make sure that they understand that uh, we're all going to be struggling and we all like like the moment you bring it out into the open and everybody knows okay everybody's dealing with that it usually tends to uh, go away and anxiety you know, it, you know, we all have it, and I think that's what being an artist is. So I don't think you need to fight it to exterminate it completely. I think you need to manage it. That make, that make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, great response. Um, as an artist, what do you do to keep your yourself rejuvenated? To keep yourself fresh? To to walk into the room each day with fresh eyes in in what you're going to be doing? Service the world. I, I think the trick is to always always look at it from the point of view of the audience. 
you've seen this a hundred times, but picture yourself as someone who's just walking into the room and seeing this for the first time. And it, it takes training because it, you need to kind of wipe your memory. And like, if I were just walking in, how would I respond to this? We, um, uh, people who, you know, do, you know, put together projects, the, the biggest danger is that we all love with our own choices. We're, we're falling in love with our own choices, right? So you will create the project that you would love to watch. And the question is, if we all love our projects and there's bad films, clearly a big part of us are, you know, delusional. So how do I know I'm not one of those? You know, how do I know I'm not one of those delusional people? So you have to be very rigorous about that. You have to really look at your own work, you know, with fresh eyes. And, and that's the key because if you're able to do that and you actually come in tomorrow and take a look at it again you realize we're on the right track this is working there's something here if i were watching this for the first time i'd be engaged and the same if you are not but at least you know what's not working so um even when i were working on a pitch right now it includes a beat board and we are crafting this as an experience for the person who's going to get the pitch you know so i will say we need something here so people you know get this it's a bit lighter and it's not so dark so we even now with a pitch is still an audience and it's still a story and we still need to give them the right experience right so it's that ability to place yourself in the eyes and shoes as you said of of your audience knowing your audience hmm. uh, having a, an understanding of of um, why they're there, um, right. all of these things. Um, hey, Mindy, I have a question. This is Tina. I have one, and there's just a few minutes left. There was this viral video that went around uh, showing you and your team in your studio waiting for the Academy Award announcement. And I'm wondering, I'd love to hear just a little bit about that, how that felt for you, and after that long journey that you've just talked about. Well, first of all, I I should say that I went into that room saying, please don't shoot this. Why would we want to record of this appointment and have it for the future, right? So I actually was not too optimistic that day that we might actually get a nomination. Um, I, I felt that, you know, uh, for sure, and we were not even thinking logically. Like if we were thinking, there's people that go, well, they go it goes alphabetically, so you know, like you know, my producer told me later, well, she knew immediately because they didn't nominate uh, Frozen, so they went past F, so that meant we had a chance. And we immediately, after hearing I Lost My Body was nominated, we thought, well, there was one slot for an independent, uh, which is taken, so that means we're out. And uh, that's why it caught us by surprise, you know, when they said Klaus, we were not expecting it. Um, we didn't do it for the awards, but man, it was nice. You know, it was, it was definitely, um, because it seemed like an impossible thing. It seemed like the kind of thing every filmmaker dreams of, but it's not going to happen to you, right? And uh, and you don't know. Um, uh, you don't. You lose the ability to judge your own film. You've seen it so many times. You don't really know. You know. Um, you know if you feel you've done everything right and you could still be delusional. You know. You know. Okay. So I know the film is entertaining, but entertaining doesn't mean good or great you know it just means it holds up and to get validated that way meant a lot you know so yeah you can see us getting totally emotional because we were not expecting that beautiful thank you yeah and a, a tremendous uh, mountaintop to to have achieved after that extensive climb um so in when you turn your sights to your next projects um what will you take with you? What will you leave at the mountaintop? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't look at this as a climb. To me, not every project is like an extension of the last one. Like we're, um, every film should be a unique experience. And, uh, and we are taking a step back and saying, okay, we, we, we did that. Uh, I, and there's nothing of it that I want to take to the next project. There's just like that's a closed loop, and that movie should be its own experience, and that's what it is, you know. And then let's create a completely different experience for other people, which means by letting go of things I've learned, that means I have to learn new things that I don't know yet, and and that's fine, you know. I mean, you do get better with the craft, obviously, because you're you're dealing with it 
time and time again. But um, if 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 the next film felt that it came from the same studio, I'd be disappointed. You know. Well, or even from the same director. Like I just I really feel someone needs to be saying animated films is not a genre, and and every film that comes out. Uh, doesn't have to be a, a family comedy, and there, uh, and that's where we did. We started with a family comedy, which hopefully was a bit more sophisticated than things that you're used to. Uh, but we are now going to see uh, what else can we do without ever stepping into that um, territory of being a tour for the sake of being an auteur. Like I still want the films to be widely uh, engaging and and um, popular but we don't have to play in the same playground every time. I think it's perhaps safe to say that uh, coming from, if it's a film you're involved with, we can expect, the, the only expectation we can have is the unexpected, which is, I think, the best expectation. That's possible. great. <laughs> Thank you, Sergio, for such an engaging time together with you. We, we are uh, huge fans, obviously, and cannot wait for, to see what is next. Um, any final wrap-up questions or thoughts from Tina and Matt? I just want to say thank you so much. This was incredible. And the chat is going crazy. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for making time. Thank, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Sergio, thank you. And thank you, everyone who joined in. Please share. Uh, links and excitement. This will be edited uh, in time and we'll have it available for you to go back at CTN to reference because so many great gems of wisdom here, Sergio. Thank you. For more information, we've got a terrific lineup taking shape uh, each week, Tuesdays at this time. And these can be found at ctntickets.com. You'll find more information about me at Mindy Johnson Creative. Sergio, you can find out more about him. Uh, we have a whole robust area of bios and content. And definitely keep tuned to Spa Entertainment because there's some great stuff coming out. Looking forward to that. Stay tuned for more great primary sources. And Sergio, thank you for being one of our best. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.